today is the last Sunday. It's the Sunday before Holy Lent. So we start Lent tomorrow. I don't know if you knew that or not. But, um, and so this is a special reading. So we take away from the month of Amshir and we read this specific Sunday uh, gospel uh, in preparation for Great Lent. Uh, one of the fathers from the Eastern Church, Father Thomas Hopko, he once spoke about the Lenten time as a time where we wrote, refocus our efforts and our energies on doing all the things that we should be doing uh, and being all that we should be as Christians. I'm going to say that one more time. He said that the Lenten time is a time where we, we refocus our efforts and our energies on doing all the things that we should be doing. In a sense, we're saying that Lent is nothing special, but it's really special. It's a reminder of what our life should be like. It's, a, it's true that during the Lenten time that we abstain from certain foods and we, we don't, you know, maybe we abstain for a period of time, which is, which is better. But that's not the heart of Lent. The heart of Lent is to cultivate our own hearts, or rather, to allow our hearts to be open to the cultivation that God would like to do within us. Look at Nineveh. We were focusing on the on, uh, the book of Jonah just not too long ago. Jonah is always a precursor to Lent. Look at Nineveh. Look at how they how they reacted. They weren't even Israel. This was not people of God. They were a pagan city, a pagan nation that worshipped a pagan god. And the prophet Jonah came and prophesied their destruction. And he said that there would be destruction on them because of their wickedness and their idolatry. And what happened? From the king to the lowest servants, the entire city repented. Everyone. Can you imagine if the president came on TV with a special announcement saying, I have sinned against the Lord. We have earned great judgment against us because of our wickedness. But I call upon everybody in the United States to fast and to pray and to put on sackcloth and to put on ashes and to call out for mercy before the Most High. Across the nations, if hundreds of millions of, of people were to bow their knees to Christ and to fast and to pray, that would be a, a, an amazing revival. That's what happened in Nineveh. To give you that context, that's what happened. They prayed, they fasted, and God heard them. And no disaster came on that city. God had mercy on them because they humbled themselves before the Lord. Let's pivot a little bit. Let's look at Adam and Eve. God had told us that fasting and prayer, he hears us. That when we fast and when we pray, he hears us. He has told us that in fasting and prayer that we have power over the demons that we don't have otherwise. We also know from the teachings of the scripture that, and the teachings of the fathers that when sin first entered into the human race, it was through sinning in food. That's when we first fell. They could eat everything in the whole garden but God told Adam and Eve, this one tree right here, just don't eat that. Just that one thing, don't eat that. Fast from the one thing. It would be like if God told us that you could have every hamburger at McDonald's except for the Big Mac. You could have anything else you want. Everything is fine. Just that one, just that one type of burger. You can go to Cold Stone and you can have any flavor of ice cream except for cookies and cream. Just that one flavor. Just avoid that one flavor. But you can have everything else. Everything else is ice cream. You can have anything you want except for this one thing. That's how easy God made it. But because 
they wouldn't keep the fast, here we are. So how do we get out of this? I've heard it once said, we die through food and we gain eternal life through food. We die through food and we gain eternal life through food. God gives us the Eucharist. The holy food to eat to restore us to life. He also gives us a chance to be obedient in regards to food and to fast like Adam and Eve could not. They refused to fast even from one food in the garden. Now that, now that we're following Christ, now that we're seeking to be obedient to him through food, through obedience to God in regard to food, we say, you know what? My belly is not God. I'm not going to be enslaved by my stomach and eat just because my stomach says I'm hungry. You see, before the fall, Adam and Eve's spirit and soul were in charge. And their fleshly body was a servant to their spirit. Now, with their spirit, they communed with God. And their fleshly body was a servant. But today, for people who don't know Christ, it's flipped upside down. Their fleshly body is in charge, and their soul and their spirit have become slaves. They call it freedom. I have the freedom to do whatever I want. I can eat what I want. I can sleep with whoever I want. I can watch TV. I can watch any show that I want. I can play any type of video game that I want. I can play whatever I want. I can sleep wherever I want, whenever I want. They call it freedom. It's not freedom, it's slavery. Do we realize what slavery is? For our spirit and for our soul and for our mind to be enslaved to the desires of our flesh so that whenever some chemicals rumble around in your stomach, you stop whatever you're doing and you think, I got to eat. I have to eat right now. No, we're enslaved to the flesh if we think that way. Oh, I'm bored or I'm lazy to do anything useful. I don't want to be bored anymore, so I have to watch a TV show. I have to play video games. I have to be on a screen. No, we're enslaved to the flesh. We're not in control. Our entire lives is being run by our fleshly body and its passion. It's not freedom, it's slavery. And so through Lent, through our fasting, through our prayer, through our almsgiving, we remind our bodies that our bodies are not in charge. That's the whole point. Our stomach is not here to control our minds and our thoughts. Our mind and our thoughts and our spirit is here to control our body. So as we go through this, it's very important that we try not to complain. That we don't grumble against God. That we don't mope around and say, man, I wonder why God makes us do this kind of stuff. We need to trust him as loving father. We need to recognize that he does this because he loves us. He's trying to heal us. And through doing this, he puts us in a position that our prayers have greater power. And this is something that we thank him for. Christ has promised us that there is a special power that comes through fasting and through prayer. And we see this joy. Our Lord says it in today's gospel. Again, the gospel today was taken from Matthew chapter 6, 1 through 18. But in verse 16, he talks about not having a sad countenance or disfiguring our faces because fasting should be joyful. We should be glad. We should be cheerful. It's an opportunity. Even though we should not participate in parties and these like over-the-top gatherings during Lent, it doesn't mean that we should be unhappy or bitter. We shouldn't be angry or bothered that we're fasting. 
Rather, we should be joyful and thankful that the Lord has given us this opportunity for another Lent. And so this wise discipline of fasting that the church has adopted for us as an, as becomes a means for us to rededicating ourselves to him in order for us to draw closer to him so that we can grow in our loving communion with him. I want to give you some practical tips for getting the most out of Great Lent. Guard your eyes. The eyes are the lamp to our soul. Lent is really an amazing time to pay attention to what we read and what we see. It's now an established fact that social media has really dramatic consequences on the youth. But it's becoming very clear that social media are is, is poisonous even to most people. doesn't matter how old you are. And I think sometimes we hyper-focus on the youth, but we are not really focusing on ourselves to the point that we're in denial. I know I am, 100%. We know of the poisons of entertainment that industry has and the psychology involved behind that. All of these things, even when they are seemingly innocent or seemingly harmless, sometimes they're of questionable value because they usually distract us and they take our minds away from the things of God. And they focus us on the things of this world. Maybe this Lent, just throwing this out there, maybe this Lent can be a time for you and your family to dramatically cut screen time. Dramatically cut it. Whether it's games or TV or just being on the screen in general. If we can avoid it, this would be a great time to fast from the screen. Maybe we can use that extra time for activities that build the family. Maybe like we can read stories together about the saints. Maybe we could just read books together in general. Does, it could be a secular book as long as it's, you know. Maybe we can play board games more often. Maybe we can go on more walks. Maybe it could be used for more personal readings and prayer. And so, again, this is not just applicable to the youth, but I'm saying this to the parents and to everybody. Maybe we have to put down our phones at the dinner table. Maybe we should focus on the dinner table and have dinner at the dinner table. I know our schedules are challenging, but perhaps if we reduce the social media time and the entertainment time, we would have a little bit more of an opportunity to sit around the table together and to look each other in the eye and to have meaningful conversations. I'm, I'm guilty of this. I have to work on this. Demiana is saying yes, she's nodding her head yes. We have to give our families our attention and not withhold our love and our focus on these, these silly things. Either way, it's time to guard our to guard our time and our minds, and this begins with looking at our eyes. The next tip: guard your lips. Our Lord Jesus Christ tells us that it is not what a man puts in his mouth that makes him unclean, but the things that come out of his mouth. During the season, I think. We're really focused on what food that we can or cannot eat. And we really try to be honest with those rules for the fast, what we put in the mouth. But please don't forget that this fast is just, it's, it's more about that. It's more about attracting the grace of God. So yes, if we abstain from certain foods, but we don't abstain from gossip, 
or from evil words, the grace of God will have a hard time finding us. And we might be in worse shape than when we started. Some of the fathers tell us that practicing silence can really help us receive the grace of God. The lips are connected to the mind and the heart. So when one is silent, the others begin to quiet down and to give room for God to speak in our depths. Another tip, which is related. Find time in your day for absolute silence. So not only for us to be silent when we can, but to find time that we can experience silence. No phones, no music, no people. 10, 15, 20 minutes of silence. Preferably kneeling in front of an icon. Especially the crucifix. If you have the crucifix in front of you and you're looking at the crown and the nails and his pierced side. 20 minutes of that in silence, not even saying a word. It will make a big difference in your interior life. Next, we want to attend more services. If in the past you attended uh, Lenten services once a week, it's good that maybe we can increase our level of participation and during the midweek services if you can. If you've never come to a midweek service during Lent, I would highly, highly recommend it if you can. There is, it's an amazing opportunity. You get to do the prostrations, the matanias. And we change our schedule so that that's a little bit more of a reality. On Wednesdays, we, we pray at 10 o'clock. And on Fridays, we pray at 3.30. We start our prayer at 3.30 on Fridays. So hopefully we can get out of school, we can come quickly to church, and, and continue in the participation of the prayers during the midweek services. Coming to church and to pray during the midweek is countercultural. It's a declaration that our time and our faith, and our commitment is to, to God. And when you come, you greatly benefit not only for yourself, but for others in your family and in the church who couldn't come. Last tip. During the Lenten season, expect to be fiercely tempted. Expect to be fiercely tempted. When we fast, when we Fast as a body of one body, one church. All of us are fasting. It's not optional. When all of us are fasting, one body, and we all increase our prayers, we're, we're making a declaration of war. But just because the enemy has, has woken up and increased his attacks, it doesn't mean that we should back down or run away or retreat. No, it's a time to fortify our defenses, to increase our attacks. And this comes through prayer and studying the scripture. One of the uh, fathers, St. Theophan the Recluse, once wrote, For a believer, there is nothing terrifying here, because near a God-fearing man, demons only busy themselves, but they do not have any power over him. A sober man of prayer shoots arrows against them, and they, are, and they stay far away from him, not daring to approach and fearing the defeat which they have already experienced. Remember that Lent is not just a season. It is a symbol of our whole life. We desire the good things of life. We desire eternal life. And so we turn to the living God, and you will have them. So I pray that this Lent be a time that we return to paradise. Paradise is not a place. Paradise is the Lord Jesus Christ. Our time spent in church will not be lost. Our money given to the poor will not be lost. 
our efforts to pray and to struggle will not be lost. None of these things will be lost. But in return for all these things, we will be found. So to conclude, fasting is not the goal. Fasting is not God. But fasting, along with prayer, is essential and indispensable tools for us to express the mourning of our sins. And it's an attempt for us to return to the God so that God will hear our prayer and He will act on it. Especially from the demons He protects us who are constantly attacking us. And as we struggle each week, we draw closer and closer to what we call Holy Week, in which we will remember and trace the follow the footsteps of the passion of our Christ. Let us offer humble efforts of worship and fasting and prayer and almsgiving. And glory be to God forever. Amen.